So this afternoon, as part of our business series, we have the pleasure of speaking with Tim Sims, AM co-founder of Pacific Equity Partners. Tim, you've had a, an extraordinary career. You've seen all manner of economic cycles. How would you assess where we're at in the current economic cycle? Yeah, I mean, I think there's arguments for it being very positive and there are arguments for it being very negative. And so my sense is that we're, if you, they sort of cancel out for those that are selective. So what's positive about it? I think there's um, enormous potential for growth. There's some paradigm shifts occurring. I think traditional consumer habits haven't changed all that much. And so I think the same old, same old continues to be true. I think there are some businesses on the downside, though, that have been hit hard and will struggle to recover. And there's certainly some investments that have gone in where people have assumed more resilience than actually proved to be the case. I think on balance, good times for selective investors, um, but more danger in the system than there has been in a more normal year. Now, one of the big issues at the moment is inflation. And I recall you mentioned in an article last year that you feared that the potential for global stimulus measures may fuel inflation. Have you seen any evidence of that occurring? And I suppose the second part of that is where do you see inflation heading toward in 2022? Yeah, well, of course, it's one of the great questions of our times and you're seeing a lot of commentary on it. And the problem with public commentary is not is that you take a position and then you're almost forced to defend it, so the debate becomes polarised. Um, so it becomes interesting. Long term, of course, we've been measuring inflation below target levels. I'm using my words very carefully there. We've been measuring inflation below target levels. There's fairly powerful evidence when we look at the impact of technology on inflation and our inability to measure that properly, that in fact inflation that we're measuring may have been above the levels that we've actually been experiencing. In other words, we've had historically in recent times quite strong deflation while measuring positive inflation. One of the reasons we've struggled to stimulate inflation is we're going off a lower base than we think. And the underlying mechanic of that is very interesting, which is how do you measure increased productivity and technology and feed that into a GDP equation? It's proving very difficult to do. So if you, if you accept that we're starting in a long-term macro, we just had relatively downward pressure on inflation. What I commented on at the beginning of COVID was we we're going to see massive disruption in supply chains, both for practical physical reasons, the trade interface between different countries and the ability to manage the trade flows was being damaged, but also there being geopolitical overlays that have further exacerbated that thing. And when supply falls short of demand, prices go up. Now, we're still, in a sense, underway throughout the, the journey of this pandemic, but when you look back over the past 18 or 20 months or thereabouts, has it played out sort of as you expected it to? Yeah, I mean, broadly, I think, I think it has. What you've seen is what I described then as a mad minute of uh, runaway uh, perceived inflation or experienced inflation. Certainly in the US, you're seeing a lot of angst now about very high levels of inflation. It's been connected, obviously, with angst about high levels of stimulus, which is a very political issue. And so the uh, commentary on that is very fierce. Question is, once we're through the immediate supply demand pressures, where will it settle down? And nobody knows that, but you've got that technology deflation effect still driving. You've got supply demand effects pushing it the other way in the short term until those are rebalanced. And then longer term, uh, the literature at least suggests and points to some pretty severe issues around smaller and smaller portions of the workforce um, actually working product productively, which of course puts pressure on the number of labourers or workers that produce and drives up wages ultimately. In and at least that's a theory. So I'd say best commentaries I've read would suggest we'll see real inflation at moderate levels going forward. We'll see the fear of hyperinflation in the short term, which is a result of short term things. But moderate inflation in the future will be moderated by continuing technology gain um, and the softening effect of that as it replaces labour. And then in terms of opportunities, have there been any opportunities that you've analysed, say, this year that you wouldn't have analysed had it not been for COVID? 
That's a really interesting question, both in the positive and the negative. Are there some that we would be looking at and are there some that normally we might have looked at that we won't? We've certainly disqualified some investments where um, they were good businesses, but the timing of the return to normal trade flows was impossible to underwrite. So it's painful. You see a business that you think is, is a good business, one that you'd like to get involved with. But literally that suspension period of waiting for things to come to normal while the business is burning cash is so profound that it's not possible to take a view. Some have taken a view and some will no doubt get away with it, as you always do when you take a view on an uncertainty, and some will not. On the other side, businesses that have been particularly benefited from, uh, from the COVID type proposition have been businesses that have been in position to meet unmet, um, unmet demand while not losing demand during COVID. An example of that would be um, surgery. There was some reduction in the amount of surgical procedures occurring during COVID, but there will be a catch up. Those necessary sur surgeries will be reinstated. Another example um, would be meat pies. As you know, coming from Victoria, meat pies are an absolute staple and a crisis, mate. And uh, so meat pies sold extremely well during COVID. People needed to have ready meal. They needed consolation. They needed to feel like life was normal. And the meat pie was a really good way to experience that. So it's been mixed. And the, the challenge for the investor has been to choose the right horses to back. Let's talk about challenges. What, what are the major risks or headwinds that you foresee either in the short term or the medium term? Yeah, well, that's, that's interesting. I mean, there must be the possibility of more COVID as the, um, one of the things about the vaccinations has been that they've proved to be very effective, but haven't been long lasting. And so there's the COVID booster uncertainty, um, but also there's the, uh, the next strain of COVID uncertainty. You know, biological theory we would say COVID should morph to a place where it doesn't kill, but it infects more readily. And we saw that with the Delta virus. So what does the world look like in a repeating scenario where you have fairly serious respiratory diseases, which become more and more infectious um, and make you feel very bad? So that's one, one thing to bear in mind. What does that world look like? And what do you do with your supply chains? And what does that look like? So when that's uncertainty, what about positive things? I think, again, technology is driving some really interesting productivity gains, new markets, new ways of doing business, new things that can happen. Again, offset against that on the negative side, we've suffered a massive blow to traditional immigration flows. How long will it take to re-establish those? What will they look like in a COVID uncertain environment? So again, I think you can't, you can't project with certainty, but you must watch with care and make sure you're choosing investments that aren't fatally wounded by, uh, by those sorts of uncertainties. Now, before we move on, I, I, one of the things I did want to ask you in, in general terms, you don't have to go into specific yeah. terms, but I read that as part of, and this has been going on for maybe two or three years, as part of a, a business roundtable for the Premier, Don Perrottet, now, uh, now Premier, former Treasurer, but um, in the depths of COVID last year, I think around May and June, you were part of that roundtable advising mm -hmm. alongside Nicholas Moore and Susan Lloyd Hurwitz and, and people of Matthew grounds, people of that elk. What are some of the things or some of the advice that you pass on to government in, in that capacity? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure of the protocol around being able to discuss what was spoken about in that committee. <laughs> it's probably fun. fine. <laughs> yeah. But to play safe, um, let me just reminisce to, for a moment. It was very exciting to be in a room full of such a disparate group, or not a room, it was a virtual meeting, full of such disparate and talented business people. You sort of left wondering why you were there. But extraordinary to be in the presence of that level of business talent uh, and extraordinary to see as Australians how in crisis people who were so disparate and so different and often only knew of each other by reputation were suddenly in one space working really well together. It's pretty, pretty exciting. I think it reflects very well on the, uh, on the politicians involved. I think Dominic reaching out to business saying, what do we do? How should we do this? And I think some of the credit surely for 
what was a world-class response in the end. I mean, we all had our angst moments and we'd like to have got vaccinated sooner in hindsight and we'd like to have closed the borders a little bit quicker in hindsight. We'd like to have had tracing a little bit quicker. But the bravery shown by government to go out and apply the stimulus the way they did and at the level they did was extraordinary, given the uncertainty we're facing at the time. Even to, easy to look back and think, well, that was pretty obvious. It wasn't. And, you know, the sirens were blaring, the bombers were overhead, and none of us knew where they were going to land. So I think it was a great moment, actually, to see those business people talking to those politicians and coming through ultimately with a set of plans which I think have done us pretty well. And without wanting to get too political, since that time, sort of mid to late last year, how would you evaluate the level of leadership shown either at a federal or Commonwealth level or at a, a state-based level? I mean, my comment would be it's normal, isn't it, in an environment where issues are really complicated, really complicated, and we're very anxious about them, and we only have two-dimensional exchange, which is speech, and a two-dimensional megaphone, which is speech through media. And we're the subjects, the verbs and the objects of the debate that we're having. The evidence from history is that humans are very poor at holding those debates. So I think the first thing we need to do is treat, tune out the sort of political tinnitus, the noise that comes with people being anxious and wanting to hold positions and having to hold positions after they've taken them. I think on balance, um, I'd have compliments for, for the political system. It's been remarkable how well they've negotiated an extraordinary crisis. Now, just before we get into the Pacific Equity Partners business, I want to ask about Tim Sims, the person, and, and in particular about your upbringing. What attracted you to business and what attracted you to study at both Harvard and Oxford universities? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm always a bit reluctant to talk about myself, but... There is a sense in which this might be encouraging to, to others. The first word that comes to mind, if you think about the seven ages of man, you've got, you know, as a child, I was raised in um, less developed countries. My family were involved in bringing um, agricultural aid to dry and uh, challenged countries. And so every three or four years, we move between countries, um, and that include a lot of very exotic locations. But the other childhood effect was that I necessarily needed to go to a stable school, my parents thought, one place of education, which meant inevitably boarding school a long way away. And so the formative experiences for me were this incredible richness of different cultures, Iran, Jordan, India, Botswana, and so many more of seeing these cultures close up and seeing how different people's lives were, but also having a sense that you could take enormous risk. You could move your home and your house to a completely different place. And there were real humanoids there that you could begin to relate to and begin to, uh, to work with and see enormous value and good being done as a result. I watched my father do that. I watched my family do that. That was formative. The second formative thing for me was going to a boarding school where the essential experience was lying in a dormitory in a freezing cold country at night listening to other little kids who were in distress and having to make a decision about whether or not I was going to be distressed or cover that uncertainty and that pain by, by attacking, by moving forward, by um, making humorous comments and by somehow sublimating that, uh, that difficulty or that challenge. And I chose the second. And so there's a, a sense in which that, choose, that chooses to make you independent, chooses to make you the best of risk that you take in an environment where you're used to moving countries and taking radical risks about what might happen next. Those were two very formative things. And what was the driving force behind that, that decision? Instead of sort of lying down and just accepting the environment that you were in, you, you chose to stand up and, and fight and, and try and work your way out of it. Where, where does that drive come from within yourself? Um, I'll say something very personal on camera. Now, the paradox of drive is that it often comes from insecurity. And so if you fail or you fall, then you have no basis on which to exist within a 
little community, or it seems that way when you're an insecure little guy in a little community. So you become the cheeky guy, you become the, the guy who, you know, who, who looks for the laugh, the insecure guy. And the truth of the matter is boldness is often a hidden insecurity. I'm pleased to say I think I've grown out of that. But that certainly was the starting point. Then there were a couple of academic institutions who, um, who were kind enough to let me in. Still to this day, I wonder if I'd had to apply again, if I'd be accepted again. Um, but there were credentials then that gave me a wide range of options. But the unifying theme of those early years was constructive accident. The reason I went into consulting was because I happened to be multilingual. I wanted to see the boat race in London, the Oxford and Cambridge boat race. I was wearing a crimson jacket from Harvard. My best friend in life was wearing a blue jacket yeah, for Oxford. And the idea of getting together on the same weekend was literally intoxicating. And uh, I couldn't afford to go to London. But the consulting industry was willing to fly me to London for an interview. So that was a life-changing moment. And what I learned in that process was that there really was a breed of people who could work alongside companies that for all intents and purposes before they arrived were doing a really good job that could make a profound difference. And you go back to those initial influences, risk taking, being a larrikin, I learned the word after I came to Australia, but making the best of a challenging situation led me to do something that was unthinkable, which is at a very young age to start a consulting firm. Once we got going, the promise that we made was, Mr. Chief Executive Officer, if we work with you, your share price will outperform all of those in your peer group. That's a pretty bold statement to make. Along with that statement, you have to make a statement that you won't work for any of your competitors. Because obviously, it it's cancels out. If you're going to have the best performing share price and I go and work for a competitor, that's a problem. So I've got to make a profound commitment to you and I'm going to commit to help you with the thing that's most important to you. Along with that, again, comes a really interesting test that you don't anticipate before you get into it, which is you can fire me without cause or notice, but if you do, I can't work in your industry for a significant period of time after that. We said five years. What that does is it reveals with incredible uncanny detail the quality of my relationship with you, because it's asymmetrical. If I'm not adding value and you have the right to dispense with me, whenever you care to do that, I become very aware of one, how productive I am or not, and two, what skill sets I have and what I don't. And what we learned very early on in the process was that no individual has the full suite of skills necessary to be outstanding advisors. You end up with a culture which is incredibly transparent and blunt with each other about where your skill sets lie and where they don't. And you end up teaming with combinations to try to deliver that share price. Now, what's interesting is what happens next. Because we track the share price. That was our key value proposition. And we asked an accounting firm to track it for us and make sure that they were real clients, who were doing real work, and tell us how quickly the index was rising. And it compounded at 42% per annum. Total shareholder returns for these companies, one in each industry, were increasing at 42% per annum, which means they double in value every two years. So how do you execute that, not you personally, but people in the management consulting industry? How can they get inside a business where there's been people in the business that have been there, they know it in and out? Management consulting people can come in and look at other opportunities. What, what do they look at that is able to then revolutionise that business and generate those sort of returns? Yeah, and so it's really interesting. And again, the answer lies in paradox, right? The, the loudest, most confident guy in the room is the most insecure guy. We discovered that with that little kid. But, but with, um, with companies, it's a paradox, which is that it's not the brilliance of the technical insight of the um, co-advisor. I hesitate to say advisor because you're the partner in the performance change. The new person from the outside that's the partner. It's not their brilliance at all. It turns out that there are probably three or four key elements to it. 
Number one element is to provide a clear technical clarity on what the full potential in a business is. That requires an enormous amount of courage. Because what you are doing, second issue is, you're, you're trapped at the moment in an incentive system which pays you a salary and a bonus. If you're really smart, and I have every reason to believe you are, your response to that is not going to be to maximize performance. It's not going to be to deliver 15% rip-roaring success for the next three years, and then one to 2% growth after that, or 3% after that. What you're going to do is you're going to persuade me, setting your bonus for hypothetical discussion purposes, to agree that 3% is great. 3% growth is great. 3% is great because GDP is growing at 3%, and clearly, it would be unreasonable to expect me to grow faster than the rest of the economy on a sustainable basis. So I agree that my bonus will be triggered at 3%. What's the problem in that? The problem is you're excellent, but I've given you an incentive system that encourages to deliver satisfactory underperformance. So the first step is, what's the full potential? Second step is, align incentives with full potential. The third step, I think, having looked back and reflected often, is to have a system which is really robust in terms of its ability to address uh, strengths and weakness in the system. So what it is, is very quietly, absolutely frank. But it's frank in a way which is sensitive to the person receiving it and humorous where it needs to be. Sounds like an incredibly silly thing to be proposing. You know, we've had maximize the business potential, we've had change the incentive system, and suddenly we're talking about how people relate to each other and what their values are. Now, I would contend that if you bring those three things together, you'll see profound change in the way that companies work. First tells you what the potential is, full potential. Second provides you with the motivation to pursue it. Why would you take the risk otherwise? And the third provides you with the means to maintain it, which is a culture of authentic truth-telling where hard truths are confessed and confronted without people feeling personally defensive. Now, obviously, if the boss of the business is a traditional boss, they're dinosaurs now, we see them very rarely, but that sort of power alpha male that was so prevalent when I began my career, what I've just described to you is not possible. The third element falls every time, the second element's corrupted, and the first element will never be explored. So that was what happened. We as very young operators making a almost impossible promise, we found that we were able through that paradox to actually deliver those results. I think it encapsulates elements of all three of those insights. There was a theme at Bain and Company which was true north. It's a really interesting concept. Um, north, as you know, is points north. True north is, uh, is slightly off from north, but it's true. And so um, there's a sense in which the culture of Bain, as I experienced it, was about uh, finding the full potential in a company, being truthful, which was often a hard thing to do um, because it calls into question previous regime, what have we been doing, how have we been doing it, and doing that in a reasoned, calm, rigorous, and constructive way. Um, and so I think Bain and Company among others, was a fine protagonist of those, of those values. And it was a real privilege to work there. And then in 1998, you co-founded Pacific Equity Partners with three others. Uh, tell me the, the transition from management consulting into private equity, how much of a, a, a learning experience was that? And then also the decision to launch the, the business itself. I might start with the second part of the question first. Um, because there was a sort of an, a negative thing there in a sense. So since a very young age, so I'd gone into the workforce when I was 22. I'd finished two major university experiences, gone into the workforce as a very young person. And um, I'd been in the workforce for a fair amount of time uh, doing something that I loved and that was extremely stimulating, um, but was iterative. I'd done it in almost every major geography. I'd done it in almost every major industry, except those that had such strong external 
challenge is that you couldn't guarantee share price on anything other than a commodity price. So I didn't, I didn't try to get involved in those industries. And I had a, a young family that was beginning to grow older. And there was a sense of deja vu in the meetings that I was taking. I was in meetings which were extremely high pressure meetings where there was an enormous amount to play for and I was having a terrific amount of enjoyment and stimulus and my mind was wandering. So that was the negative influence, which is I needed to apply those same skills in a different environment after nearly 20 years. And I think that's a learning for us all, which is the danger of being rewarded by success in a particular avenue is that you can stay there. And that's okay. But remember that little guy was moving between countries. Even within consulting, I was moving between countries and between things, taking risk, enjoying risk, reveling in danger, um, false or otherwise. So those same characteristics playing through. And so um, it seemed that the right risk to take was to, um, was to step away from traditional consulting and monetize our efforts in a different way. The last client that I had the privilege of working with was Woolworths. And we started at Woolworths with a share price that was below $4. And when we left that uh, particular assignment, working with an amazing management team, um, share price was hugely more than that. And the shareholders made vast amounts of money. We'd been rewarded well, but it was a fraction of the value that we'd actually created. So the idea came to monetize that skill set and the sheer joy of seeing companies transformed in the way that I've described differently. I had the privilege of knowing a man who became very famous um, on his journey of life, which was Mitt Romney. Mitt and I had worked together um, between 1980 and 1983. And at one point, we shared recruiting responsibilities in Bain and we shared responsibility for solving a particular recruiting problem that brought us quite close together. Um, and so we'd, we'd had a relationship of trust and respect that had lasted those years. So I went to Mitt, who was in private equity, and I said to Mitt, I think my mind's wandering and I respect what you do. How do I change? And then a very shocking thing happened, which is I was sitting in front of Mitt's desk and I remember he had a Persian carpet on the floor and see, he said, I'll help you to do that. So I said, yeah, that'd be great, Mitt. He picked up the phone and he called probably the five most respected investors in the world at the time and suggested they invest in a new fund in Australia with a new investor who'd never invested before. So that was an incredible privilege. And in fact, looking back, extraordinary that he would have taken the brand kudos that he had and risked it on funny little guy from Australia, um, but he did. And that was the beginning. We had to solve uh, technical problems. It was the first fund of its kind to come into Australia, 1998. And there hadn't been a significant fund which hosted overseas investors before. And so we had the privilege of seeing the first leverage buyout, independent leverage buyout fund supported by international investors established here in Australia. So that's how the transition occurred. So a little bit of, hey, we need to change, and a little bit of, hey, if we change, the things that we do could be even more exciting, uh, perhaps maybe if we succeed. And what's your definition of private equity and, and what do you see as its role? I think the definition's changed a little bit over time. Um, in its, at its heart, private equity is an opportunity to radically change the incentive systems of management. Remember my three pillars of um, excess performance or sustainable improved excellent performance? The opportunity to set a new plan, the opportunity to incent people differently, and the opportunity to change their culture to make it very at cause, very able to deal with challenge and shared risk. Those are the three things that drive superior performance. And I think at the heart of private equity, number two reigns, which is a different incentive system. But numbers one and three are also brought into play because now we have a company which isn't providing quarterly returns to its investors. It's on a longer cycle. 
So it can take a longer view of investment. Now you have a company where the management can take a very significant percentage of the value that's being created. And now you have a company that has to dispense with a lot of relatively unproductive meeting time, which has to do with a particular form of compliance, which has to do with retail capital, and can focus that energy instead on adding value. And when it makes a mistake, can reverse that mistake quickly. So at its heart, that's what private equity brings. Now with all those things, it looks like alchemy from the outside. Well, hang on a minute. Um, you know, you bought a company with, for a 30% premium from the public markets. You paid 30% more than people thought it was worth. You promised your investors you're gonna make a net 20% return. Where's the trick? There must be a dishonesty here because those things don't add up. And what that's generated has been an enormous zest in the marketplace to look for the trick. Asset strippers, um, short-term optimizers, um, and all sorts of other slogans that have grown up around that. Politics of envy and of not really understanding what it is that they're trying to sort. And of course, in an industry as eclectic as ours, you can always find an example of one of those plays and say, there you are, I told you so, that's what those guys do. But the reality can't be that for really interesting reasons. So we buy a company and for sure, the night we buy it, all other things being equal in simple terms, we paid more for that company than anybody else thinks is worth. You go to bed at two o'clock in the morning. Why at two? Because it always takes an extra day of legal time, billable legal time to get the agreement signed. So you go to bed early in the hours of the morning and you know you've paid more for that business than other people think it's worth. And you know you've promised to investors to make the 20% uh, net returns. But then you remember the three golden rules and you come back the next day and you look for truth. You look for excellent management teams but probably what I have emphasized enough so far on this discussion is the need to have excellent management teams. Um, you know, I'm stretched in my management confidence to manage a small office of 40 people. I'm not a guy who could manage a big company, shall we say, for the sake of discussion. But we look for excellent managers who with those three things and the fourth ingredient of being excellent managers can make the difference. And so that's how it works. So that's private equity. Of course, now, there are some listed private equity companies, but that genus, that type of behavior still holds true. I want to unpack that excellent management teams. What does that look like? What are the traits that you look for? I feel I should apologize for coming to the excellent management team late, um, but that's really because I was describing the key elements of success through a public company lens where management are fixed to a large extent and you're the consultant. And what makes for excellent managers? Well. Excellent managers are people who can use those three levers extraordinarily well. So they're people of clear understanding, who can understand the full potential in a business, a deep commercial understanding. They're people who are motivated uh, to take risks for success in a measured way. And they're people in the end who have a degree of humility that licenses humility within the system ability to talk frankly without big noting yourself. And only in those systems are you okay to make a mistake. So here's, a, here's an anecdote for you. When I was a consultant and I would come to a new chief executive officer of a new company, and they were often starting out new and they wanted that special relationship to start out. Um, we would look for, for opportunities to do things which were extremely valuable to the business and low risk because those early things had to succeed. But we also say, if we fail in one of those, and we should make sure we don't fail in something extraordinarily important, if we fail in something, let's celebrate failure. Let's own up to it. Because with that comes a profound change in culture, which is the chief executive made a mistake and apologized. And we shared it and we all worked together to resolve it. All of a sudden, we're not managing each other's perceptions anymore. In a perfect world, we're sharing our weaknesses and we're working together in a very different way. 
And working in, a, in an environment where you're forced to bury weakness, which is the expectation management default, because if, if, I, if I do something bad, then your expectation will be I'm no good. Uh, but no, if you can be resilient and you can be allowed to do something bad and own up to it, then you're profoundly valuable. And so often those leaders of businesses have the ability to take risk and to own up when they get it wrong and reverse the decision. And that is the ultimate defining moment in an excellent chief executive. When they get the right plan with the right motivation, they choose the right people to help them deliver it. They operate the business in a way that treats truth profoundly carefully and manages risk in an open-handed way. We were, as I say, the first fund of our kind in Australia. And so those early investors were very brave. They came to the land down under um, and they tried um, private equity experiment with untested resource. It was somewhat persuasive to them. We could show them nearly 20 years of this um, profit improvement, share price improvement. So we were as good as we were as good as delivered experienced players, but we weren't. So those early investors had to take that risk. And I think Mitt's endorsement was very important. Our first investor was David Swenson at Yale. He was the guru of private equity. Yale had a profoundly larger allocation to private equity than most other organizations. He wrote the book on it. He was an extraordinary individual. And so Yale were our first investor. And what we found with Yale, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, MIT, which were the, the majority of our early investors, was that they wanted to grow their position. The first fund was successful, they wanted more. And so for those first three funds, we're really expanding to service the capacity demand of existing investors. And then so it wasn't really possible or easy to take on significant new investors in those first three funds. And then along comes fund four in 2008 of significant scale and magnitude, the largest fund ever, I think, in Australian history, $4 billion in the depths of, of the GFC. Tell me about how that uh, experience was for, for the business, how you managed to raise that level of capital and, and some of the business success stories that arise from that fund. Yeah, so to get to that point, we had broken conventional land speed records. Con convention said that to grow your fund more than by more than 2x was unwise, unconscionable, and unlikely to succeed. And so we had each time stepped up dramatically in fund size. Uh, and so in many ways, fund four was an attempt to accommodate the existing investor base and to add a significant set of new investors. And the world's largest and most established investors need a minimum footprint. And so the, the genius of resolving that was to turn the fund into a two-tiered fund, 2.5 billion of full fee paying two and 20 capital. And then, or 2.3, I think it was at the time, and 1.7 billion of co-invest, which only paid money on drawdown. And the beauty of that was that you didn't have this hunchback, this enormous overload of capital that you had to seek to deploy. If you didn't deploy the additional tranche of capital, then there was no harm in that because it wasn't charging fees to investors. So we set out to deploy our two and a half billion dollar, a little bit under um, fund, uh, which felt like the right size. And we had the additional capacity to step up. These were in days before um, co-invest was well developed in the industry. Now co-invest is a regular thing. So in a sense, it was bespoke, tailored innovation to create that additional capacity so that you had a fund that was big enough, right size for Australia, but capable of expanding. And I should say, just while we're on innovation, we'd, we've been pushing the boundaries in every sense. So we, I think, were the first to do a public to private as a private equity firm. We were certainly the first to do a private to public. Um, we were the first to do a term loan B issuance in the, in the North American market. There were many firsts that we had experienced. And so in a sense, it was brand defining to try to solve the co-investment problem uh, in one of our funds. And it, it went pretty well. 
the issue with Fund 4 for us was that we'd invested a third of it before the financial crisis and two thirds after. The third that went in before the financial crisis performed fine, but we had to hold it a long time. So a good multiple of money, an inferior IRR to what we'd been producing in the norm. What we invested after the crisis was excellent um, and, and had all the hallmarks of the normal funds. You had normal fund and you had a pre-financial pre, uh, crisis, solid multiple of money, diminished IRR fund. So that was the story of Fund 4. Um, clearly, Fund 5, we went to um, 2.5 billion with industry-based co-invest. So same concept, different structure. So the same 2.5, or might, might have been, I think it was 2.5, there, thereabouts, with co-invest widely available by then in the industry. So you telephone our well-known investors and you say, we've got an investment that's too big for us to do. Would you be interested in participating? And by then, the industry was fully qualified for that. So in a sense, strategy didn't change. The manifestation of it did between four and, um, and five. And the returns have continued to be you know, average net returns on our funds, mathematical average, excluding the new products, um, which have increased the average of being a little over 20% net per annum for, for more than 20 years. Just reflecting on Fund 4, there were a number of success stories within that fund being Hoyts, Energy Developments and Spotless, and there were also some challenges along the way with AST and, and Red Group. When you reflect on that particular fund now, what are the, the lessons that you've learnt and were there any mistakes that were made? No, you'd be surprised having heard me say how important it is to have, um, to have mistakes owned up to that, you know, I relish that question. That's, uh, there were clearly mistakes made and things to be learned. Both very painful experiences, very painful experiences indeed. Um, often the mistakes or the, the issues are not the same as those that appear from the outside. And so without getting morbid about it and going into the detail, the net, net of it is um, we made a decision not to pursue significant acquisitions offshore. AST was an example of that. And we made the decision that we weren't smart enough to buy companies that had retail activities as their main activity. Um, now, that's a very simplistic proposition. But what I can say to you is that in the 10 years since those decisions were made, or more than 10 years, nearly 12 now, the gross returns on realized assets has been north of 50%. Um, but the detail behind those stories is itself interesting. Uh, I don't know if we have time to explore. In the US, the main Achilles heel in the AST business was that a significant portion of its returns came from interest levels in the US. We knew that when we went in, we put variable cost debt into the mix, but we looked at the probability that interest rates in the US would be low for long periods of time. And we noted that in the last 60 years, interest rates had only been as low as 2% for very, very short periods of time. And so um, the investment looked robust. We're in the risk business. Remember that guy in the risk business? We're in the risk business. There's the data. We should structure for low interest rates because we think they're coming. But no one can imagine that interest rates will stay at close to zero for nearly 12 years. That was the profound issue that we had with AST. And we knew that it was exposed we looked at the data and we said we can handle that exposure and um, we didn't anticipate 12 years of interest rates. So whatever you heard me say at the beginning about my forecast on interest rates, probably should take it with a pinch of salt. Um, but the data was certainly compelling there. Um, on on um, Red Group, the issue there um, was not that it got run over by um, internet ordering of books. We were very strong in that area. The issue there was when the global crisis came, the exchange rate whiplashed to a point where books were cheaper for our customers than we could buy them for under parallel import restrictions. So we were a disadvantaged supplier to our customers. In a large fixed cost business, what that means is instead of buying 2.7 books per visit, customers buy 2.1 books per visit. And if your gross profit on selling a book is 50%, that's 100% of your profit. So it was a bizarre thing that we didn't anticipate or see, um, which was very humbling in the diligence process. But it happened. You probably remember how wide the swing was in exchange rate. 
uh, and how much publicity was given to the notion that you could buy books offshore without paying GST at subsidized exchange rates. Even then, only a small group of customers shifted, but in a fixed cost business, that's enough to take away your profits. Just before that, it was the most profitable bookstore chain in the world. So, you know, what are the learnings? Don't do retail, don't buy offshore, but actually, um, in a risk-based business, sometimes you get caught uh, with the unexpected that you can't reasonably forecast. No excuses there, just that's what happened. I want to move into current market dynamics and, and active investments that the business has underway. Fast forwarding to the launch of Fund 6, I, think, I believe it was in July of last year, which closed to the tune of $2.5 billion. I understand that the mandate of this fund continues the tradition of investing in underperforming market leaders across Australia and New Zealand, as you said, so not offshore, uh, apart from New Zealand. What are the key thematics that you've seen within that fund or, or within the sector more generally? Yeah, well, um, two probably at the macro level and then we can break it out and go down. I think the themes for investing in the core fund, the LBO fund, have remained profoundly common for a long time by uh, products and services that customers need and by businesses that are well positioned to deliver those and apply the three key principles. Um, they're not simple to apply, or I should say four, have good management and apply the three key, key principles under that. So those, it would be wrong to suggest that any of those are changed. At the margin, we've seen some businesses that are answering to new needs. Uh, Modern Star is not a new need, but it's a very interesting need, which is supplying school supplies to schools. Really interesting business and we're really enjoying that business. Uh, for example, in the, in the new businesses we bought there. Um, so the story for Fund 6, I think, is business as usual with the flavor of the contemporary market developments that are occurring around that. The second truth though is really interesting, which I think the, the market's grown to a point of sophistication now where you're seeing more refined segmentation of products in the market. This often happens with maturing markets where there was one product, there's now a refined product. You see it in almost all areas of human activity. And what that's meant for us is we've seen a space which is what I call value-added infrastructure, smaller infrastructure plays where operating value-added is important. And we proposed a, a solution to our investors which was we'll buy businesses that in normal circumstances that the price we're paying can't make less than 10% returns. We'll add value to those with the expectation of making 15. And that's a really interesting investment opportunity for defensive investors. I can't get less than 10. Well, you could, but the logic holds that it's overwhelmingly unlikely. And actually, you're likely, given the track record of the people involved, to get much better than that. So 10 to 15 with very low risk on the, on the downside. That's a very popular product. We put that to work and we've been astonished by how strongly that's performed, the first sort of $770 million that's gone out. And we'll be raising a new fund in that space now. Um, the maiden returns on that fund look extraordinary uh, to the point where they may be north of 50%. Um, so it's a really interesting space and one we've greatly enjoyed. Another example of a more, a more refining focus has been what we call, um, what we might call value added debt, but we call it capital solutions to give the full flavor of what's happening, which is rather than buying a company, we're bringing debt capital to bear with advice, with support, with all of the paraphernalia that we'd normally bring to bear with our equity product. But our relationship with the, with the client is defined as debt so we look to be paid a coupon on the debt, 8% cash coupon paid quarterly. That's very attractive for investors and it's very, very acceptable for borrowers in an environment where they've got a clearly defined strategy, full potential, where they've got um, a clearly defined incentive system to pursue it and where they've got the right culture to convert that with the right managers. An 8% cash yields a relatively easy proposition tops up to 12% with warrants at the end of four years. 
So here's a product where you get 8% in cash, and you get 12% at the end of four years. Um, I've heard it described as a term deposit on steroids. But again, very, very exciting space. So those are examples of further refinement of the private equity offering for our, for our customers. I recall in, uh, you mentioned in an article that the discrepancy between small deals, middle tier deals and large deals is relatively narrow in terms of investment performance with large deals, I think, returning two and a half times the money and small deals at around 2.4 times the money. Yeah. That article was several years ago. Is that still the case today? Yeah, the, it's interesting. The context of that article was the, again, well, let me say something I, I like to say, and I think it's true. When you half understand something, you absolutely don't understand it. And I think when you're looking from the outside at sim and trying to make simple notions like private equity, the immediate catch cry that comes to mind is, ah, a big company will be a company where it's harder to add value. It's got more professional managers, so they surely they've they've squeezed the lemon more carefully. How how can it be that you can add value to a big company? And I would say that one of our most important success stories early on, we bought from a very large multinational company, and um, and had extraordinary returns. And so the mistake made, which I was trying to address in that article, is that. The big means lower returns. Um, equally, on the other side, there can be a mythology that small companies, you get sort of a venture thinking, small companies get better returns, don't they? Well, often not necessarily because their market power and the degrees of freedom they have to, uh, strategic degrees of freedom they have is less. And so the point I was trying to make is that all of those if they're correctly selected, are capable of extraordinary performance. And it's not necessarily differential based on starting position of scale. It's not a key determinant. And then in terms of the actual size of deals, no doubt if you wanted to, you could go and chase the investments in, say, a Crown Group or a Sydney Airport, um, like we've seen with some of those overseas players. But why do you aim, or what is the business aim between, say, 200 to 500 million on the whole? Yeah, so our, our sweet spot or our focus is between 200 of enterprise value to maybe a billion two of enterprise value. Um, part of that is the maths of the fund, right? If you're looking to put, uh, with fees, up to eight positions into a single fund, then you might have an average equity check of 300, which gives you an average enterprise value of 600. That's in the middle of that range. If you add the co-investment capacity, um, then you can stretch to much higher numbers. Uh, and so part of the explanation is the structure of the fund and therefore what the fund will tend to look for, smaller than 200, and the parcel of capital that you're looking after can be distracting in the context of trying to manage what becomes, when it's mature, quite a full portfolio of different positions. Um, so that's the, that's the dominant reason. The second reason, though, is there's very different competitive dynamics in those spaces. Um, if you're a five billion US dollar um, pan-Asian fund um, whose market is defined as uh, shopping between Seoul and Perth, which is roughly the equivalent flying time as flying between Los Angeles and Moscow, if that's your business proposition. And you need to, again, deploy the portfolio in a way that makes sense in terms of capacity and scale, then you're going to be looking for deals that are above a billion US of enterprise value. And you're going to be shopping across the system to do that. There are a large number of players with that predicament. Um, and because they're a pan-Asian fund in terms of the value proposition, it's likely that to prove that geographic spread, they're going to have to do a deal in Australia during that time frame. And I'm making it very simple so that we can explain it quickly, but um, the result of that is that the economics of those very large deals can be different in terms of competition at the buying point. You've been very generous with your time, so just a, a couple of quick questions to finish. You've had a, a career full of deal making, particularly in the, in the latter part of it here at Pacific Equity Partners. What are the fundamentals to successful deal making? I think I might go back to those three 
key propositions that we spoke about. I think a clear-eyed sense of what the full potential is in a business. That may seem simple, but without, I would find that difficult without an apprenticed group of 40 professionals helping to inform that discussion. And I would find that really difficult without 20 years of practicing the understanding of that on someone else's ticket. Now, we, as you know, we added value, or at least we didn't stop value being added in the previous life. But I think experience has a lot to do with understanding full potential, not theoretical potential, full deliverable potential. The second thing, I think, is having a clear sense of incentives and quality of people that you work with. And the third and most important thing, I think, is having an ability to confront mistake, failure, lack of skill, and team up, overcome, share. And so, for example, in our investment committees, we won't buy a business unless all of the members of the investment committee agree that it's the right thing to do. Um, because we don't want a situation where if the business goes bad, we ever have a fractured culture where somebody says, I knew better than you. No, we share this risk. If you're not comfortable, we won't do it. Speaking of culture, that's obviously one element of building culture. What are the other elements that have worked so successfully here? Well, I think in, in the end, the, I won't say the unwritten book of business, but you'll get my sense of it. The most undervalued, under understood element in business is relationship. Relationship is a key input to the assessment of risk. Nothing grubby about it, nothing inappropriate about it. If I know you and I've seen you under pressure, we've been in the trenches together, we've, uh, we've, we've done battle together, uh, then I know something about you which is really important in the assessment of risk. If I know you to be truthful, then when you tell me something, I know it will be true. I know that if you're not sure, you'll tell me you're not sure it's true. Uh, if you're I tend to be a little bit depressive and on the negative side of truth. If you tell me you're not sure, but you think it might be, I know what that's likely to be in real life. So relationship and understanding and trust, I think are the key, is the key element. And it's very hard, it's costly, um, because it requires you to invest and to be vulnerable and for others to be vulnerable. And it requires you to experience less than perfect things. Uh, to build that. But I think relationship, we've been in this market now since 1987, either as advisors or as investors, and we've tried to be consistent. We've tried to fess up when we've made mistakes. Again, that risk mitigation, risk recovery thing. We've tried to be consistent. So I hope that when we go to market, managers who are hosting the process of selling businesses to us under supervision of investment banks see us as people that they might have a really rewarding journey with. I hope that that comes across. I hope that advisors see us as people who do what we say we're gonna do. And after all, we're principals making decisions on the ground, whereas international competitors, by definition, have principals making decisions offshore. So structurally, that makes us more, more reliable, I think. Um, and so advisors see us as more reliable. We haven't lost a dollar of bank debt in the investing time we've done, despite playing with high levels of leverage. Sometimes it's been very painful to defend the bank debt. The equity's been gone. We've been defending the bank debt. On one occasion, it took me nine years to get the bank debt out. What that means is the banks see us as truth tellers. The banks get quarterly reports or monthly reports on all investment positions in the private equity space in Australia. They're profoundly transparent view. And so will the banks trust you? Will the advisors trust you? Will management trust you? And will vendors trust you? And I think that's where a relationship comes into play and consistency. At least we flatter ourselves with that view. Um, sometimes you see the bad guys win, um, but that's okay too. Tim Sims AM, one of the great intellectuals in, and one of the great Australian business success stories, not just in private equity, but in management consulting and, and right across the board of all the roles that you've been involved in. Thanks so much for your generosity and for your time. Thank you for really an extraordinarily searching, um, but really enjoyable interview. I've really enjoyed the time. Thanks, Rob.